So most biblical scholars agree that the story of Job, or the story we know as the book of Job, was probably written over 3,000 years ago. Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And I would guess that while most of us are familiar with the contours of the story, I would also guess many of us have never read it. But we know the themes of it. We recognize those themes. Those themes are universal. The problem of human suffering and evil in the world. So at the heart of the book of Job is a question humans have been asking for thousands of years. How do we reconcile a loving creator, a God, and a world seemingly deep and shaped by unfairness? Where good and faithful people experience catastrophic loss and suffering. And conversely, we have people who often seemingly undeserving still prosper and succeed. Why is there such suffering in this world? How does it seem that evil wins? Often where good and innocent people suffer. So it's a question as deeply a human question as we can ask that's thousands of years old, as real and as contemporary when we ourselves experience devastating news. A dire medical diagnosis, the death of a loved one, seeing human suffering on scales we cannot imagine. Life can seem and does seem, let's admit it, gratuitous and arbitrary and profoundly unfair. It's a universal question, but a deeply personal one for us as well. And so we have someone who writes the book of Job, facing directly that question that mystery. The story begins, I don't know if you remember this from Sunday school or a previous sermon, the story begins that God is returned to the heavenly court after having visited the world and God comes back and he lifts up, he celebrates. Did y'all not see Job, a man of integrity who loves me and turns from evil? And then a character in this heavenly court, labeled the adversary, challenges God. Of course, the adversary says, Job loves you because he's been showered with good things. Prosperity and wealth and good health, all the good things of life. Why wouldn't Job really love you? he didn't have such things. Now it's important to note that the story of Job is kind of somewhat like a folk tale in a sense, a moral fable. It's not really describing how God really works. It's simply setting the stage, giving us a setting for what is about to unfold. God, we must believe, because the rest of the scripture points to this, does not play dice with our lives. Our lives are not an arbitrary uh, gamble amongst the heavenly court. The very real heart at the question of this story is really a question God wants answered. Does Job really love God or is it simply a transaction? We think of faith in that way. I get good things and I have a good life and I get my rewards for being faithful to God, but do we really love God in God's self, for the sake of God, or for what we get out of it? So Job loses everything. Children and grandchildren, his wealth, his health, 
in a seemingly and arbitrarily gratuitous and arbitrary way. The suffering is so profound, and this all occurs in the first two chapters of the book of Job. The suffering is so profound that even his wife turns to him and says, you who have lost everything, she has lost everything as well. And she tells him, go ahead, curse God and die. Yet Job refuses to renounce God. His faith, he doesn't renounce his faith, he does not renounce his love for God. It's not rooted in some sense of reward or imagined divine protection, but something much deeper. In a strange twist, if you think about it, God wins the bet, right? Job is truly a person of integrity who loves God. Yet, Job complains. Job rails against God. Job pleads with God. Job does not let God off the hook for a minute. Job demands God for an answer. For the evil and suffering he has experienced, the focal point, if we will, is not about God's justice, whether God is just at all, but rather, really, this story is about the problem of human pain. If you think about it, the problem of human pain, how Job endures it, how Job cries out from it, how Job wrestles furiously with God in the midst of it, it is not, I would say, a story that tells us the theology of suffering, but it is a theology of the sufferer. Job demands God answer for his suffering. Show up, God, answer me. Then entails most of the book of Job which is a conversation with Job's friends who are about who arrive in, in, in intentionally so and greatly so to give Job solace. And they start off well enough, if you think about it. They sit, we are told, on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights in silence. For they saw, we are told, how great was his pain. And there is an important truth in this initial reaction of those closest to Job, that often the best response to the pain of others is not the words we say, it's not, it's not in many ways uh, solving the pain, but it is simply being willing to share the pain in silence. There's something profoundly human in that. I often tell people, they will ask me, I, I'm just always uncertain when I have someone, a friend who's lost someone or has had a devastating diagnosis, and I'm just not even really sure, or someone who's, who's, who's experienced the death in their family, I'm just not sure what I can say and I worry about something to say and I try to remind folks that the truth is, in those times, people don't remember what you say, they just remember you were there. But Job's friends can't stay silent. They got to explain why they're suffering. You must have messed up somewhere, Job. You must have sinned in some way, done something unfaithful to God for God to punish you in that way. For them, I imagine, it was really important to have an explanation for it. For what was at stake was this truth about the universe. Is it really fair? Well, it must be fair, because you must have done something wrong to deserve this, right? For over 30 chapters, they try to give a theological education, theological explanation to Job about why he is experiencing suffering. And I promise you, 
when people are in pain, they're not looking for theology or any explanation of it. And Job refuses their explanations and asserts, this is not my fault. Job is truly a person of integrity and Job remains faithful. I'm reminded, have any of you have heard of uh, Kate Fowler? Uh, she's a Canadian writer, academician, whose life, she, she says, was by all measures truly blessed. She married her high school sweetheart. They had a son, Zach. She was given her dream job, a professor of Christian history at Duke University, was having, by all measurements, great success in life. But then, in a sudden moment, she receives devastating news. Stage four cancer. Terminal diagnosis. And all that came crashing down. She wrote a book about her experiences, especially about those who tried to give her theological reasons for God allowing this to happen. The title of the book, by the way, is Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I Have in which she challenges our need for neat explanations for suffering and the harmful ways it portrays God as cold, God as punishing. So finally, about 38 chapters into the book of Job, Job has maintained his integrity the suffering is not his fault, nor is it a result of a lack of faith or faithfulness. But finally, after 38 chapters, God shows up. Speaks from a whirlwind. And God, before speaking to Job, denounces Job's friends and their trite theological explanations for why this happened to him. And God answers. But it's not an answer that is really, if you read it, a clear answer. So what is the answer God gives to Job? God starts with the limits of human wisdom and understanding. That Job was not there at the very founding of creation, the very building of the foundations of creation. And that Job, I'm not sure Job, God says, can truly grasp the mystery of it all. Job is not God. Some things defy explanation. Some things can't be captured by human wisdom. Ways to comprehend or rationalize away. God respects Job. And I would say profoundly loves Job enough to honor his integrity. The integrity of his suffering, not by giving some glib answer that explains it away. God meets Job in his suffering. And then we come to the passage I read this morning. The part of God's answer to Job that is also an explanation, but it's not really an explanation. God points to what God has made. And in particular, God points to the wild animals that live outside our human world. Look at what I made, God says. Is it not wild and beautiful and unexplainable? The very existence of the wild goat who gives birth that you never are aware of or can never see. The very existence of an ostrich who flaps around though it can't fly. The very existence of the eagle who flies on top of the mountain. Look at this mystery. Look at this creation. Look what I have made. And be in.
So if you think about it, God is saying creation itself is gratuitous. Life is a gift beyond any explanation we can give. In other words, it's all grace. For the nature of the creator of our universe is to create things and sustain things simply because it is the nature of God to give freely and abundantly to all creation, to the wild ass and to the goat, to the eagle and the ostrich. So God invites Job to contemplate that mystery. To see how everything is a gift from the goats who give birth in the mountains to the ostriches who lay eggs, the eagle on its nest on high. It's all grace, everything, every moment, everything in existence. And Job is invited to encounter that mystery and ultimately, I think, transcend his own pain. Even more than that is pain is transformed into something else. God invites Job, and I think invites us, to see the gift and grace of it all. Every breath we take, it's a gift. Waking up this morning, it's a gift. The moments we have with each other, with our loved ones, with our children, our grandchildren, those moments we share, they're all just this gift gratuitously given to us. It's a gift when I get to hug a tree or hike on a mountain. It's a gift when I read a book or hold the hand of a loved one. It's all, every bit of it, grace. There is a quote from Frederick Buchner, one of my favorite writers, Presbyterian minister. I love it dearly, and he goes, listen to your life, Frederick Buchner says. See it for the fathomless mystery it is. In the boredom and pain of it, no less than in the excitement and gladness. Buchner encourages us to touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of life. Because in the last analysis, he writes, all moments are key moments, and life itself is grace. To God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen.